Okay, welcome everybody to BibleQuests.tv. We're glad you're here today. This Tuesday afternoon, um, we have a very interesting uh, program today. I think we lost one of the members. I'm not sure if we did or not. I don't see. I don't see Jeff's video. So I, I'm here. I'm here. I see okay. everybody. All right. Let, let me bring everybody in officially. Scott Smeltzer, where are you at today? You it looks like. Are you in a prison? Yes, I am in prison. They caught me. And you're, you're out on a break. <laughs> I am out in the countryside here, if you can see. Yeah. So this is Landisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, on the way up to Bowlesburg uh, with a trip with the wife. Uh, our anniversary trip kind of got knocked out with uh, mechanical problems, and so we're kind of replacing that this afternoon. Well, thank the missus that she's letting you do the broadcast on the <laughs> anniversary trip. Drew, you're still sharing your screen. Oh, yeah. Let me stop that. Thank you. Okay, Stephen, good to have you. But you didn't leave. You're, you're over there in Harrisburg, right? That's right. Still in the same place. All right. Good to have you here. Jeff down in Exton, Pennsylvania. Hi, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to have you here, everyone. If you're coming in uh, on our Zoom app, be sure to use the Q&A button to text in or to text in your questions or comments during, this, during the program. Probably oh, lost you there for a second. Your audio is kind of coming in and out. Some of it may be, uh, Scott, your uh, mic is picking up a bit of wind noise that may be interfering a little bit. Guess what? Uh, yeah, Scott, so hit your uh, mute button when you're not talking. Okay. All right, that'll help with that, hopefully. Uh, and Stephen, so Pete, you are broadcasting on your Facebook page, right? Yep, that's right. If you're joining us on my Facebook live feed, feel free to leave your comments and questions as we go in the comment section below, and we'll get to those as soon as we can. Excellent. So um, today we're going to be talking about, a, a, I guess it's a sensitive topic and subject. Um, we just discussed the things prior to the program, what we're going to talk about, but we don't have a script and we don't plan how we're going to talk about it. But today we're going to talk about, we we're talking about uh, the problems, what's in the head headlines today, uh, the, uh, the Catholic problems, the Catholic church issues, right guys? Yeah, it's, it's been big news the last few days uh, here in Pennsylvania and certainly especially here in Philadelphia. And, and uh, some years ago, it was big news then when a number of priests were uh, found to have been involved in uh, pedophilia, uh, sexually abusing various people, and, um, and it was being covered up by some of the higher-ups, and we've got something similar going on again now that's in the news. Scott, you got to unmute. Yeah, let me share just uh, some headlines here, and I'm not going to talk about everything that's all these articles, but just so if people want to understand a little bit more of what's going on. Uh, here, WITF, PBS, Frontline, they had a thing. Can I, oh, did I do share screen? Uh, not yet. Okay, let me hit share screen. I'll just do that for a minute or two. Um, you know what? I don't see, I'm set up differently today. I don't see how to do that. So I'll just kind of mention what these are. Oh, I think we may have lost your signal there. If you read, uh, yeah, your signal is not coming through strong, Scott. You are breaking up. We've got a problem, Houston. Well, when, when Scott's signal comes through, he can give us some of the details. It's muted, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, your mute's turning on and off there, Scott. But it. it the, the, the basically, I think a lot of people who are in our audience have probably seen the headlines, and, and most of us have really not seen much more the headline, than the headlines, but what is, what is clear again uh, is that uh, it's being widely reported a number of, uh, a large number of Catholic priests uh, have been involved in sexually molesting people. Pedophilia is, is certainly been prominent. And, and just most recently, the, the Pope himself has been accused of kind of uh, not doing all he could, in fact, maybe to some extent protecting uh, some who have been involved in this kind of thing. 
And so our point here is not to just to go on a, a rant about the Catholic Church. Uh, and the fact is there are going to be people who are guilty of all kinds of sexual immorality in various um, denominations as well as in the irreligious world. But there is a point to be made here, and, and that is that when you have a religious institution that, that, that their orthodox or their, their teaching, their official doctrine um, perpetuates a, an, a, an unscriptural and unnatural uh, idea about sexuality and certainly about um, sexuality and marriage amongst their clergy or their priests, it's not surprising that you would get a significant percentage of people serving in those capacities who have an unnatural perception and, and unscriptural perception of sexuality. And, and so what I think it'd be good for us to do today is talk a little bit about what the Bible teaches. Does the Bible teach that there's something more holy about being sexually celibate? Uh, does the Bible teach that those who are religious leaders cannot, have, cannot be married? Scott, are you back with us? I see his video. I do not hear his audio. You know, but he's such a good-looking guy. If we just have his video, that's a privilege, I think. <laughs> Some, he's muted, but he looks like he's also video frozen. Oh, I thought I heard him there for a second. Okay. Now the video is frozen, so it looks like we're having connection issues on Scott. All right. I'm now. Hey, Scott, we hear you now. Oh, we did. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go out and come in. I heard go out and come in. Yeah, it's going out and coming in. That, that is true. <laughs> All right. Well. Go out and come in. <laughs> go, go out and come in. Okay. Yeah, we're question. just catching every few words here, Scott. This is a uh, connection. Panelist. Is not good. Panelist. Uh, that's us. That's us. <laughs> I feel like oh, we are. Oh, okay. He's come in as a viewer. He wants us to promote him to panelists. Ah, let me see if I can do that here. Yeah, you can. If you I'll just... take care of that. Okay. Viewers and promote him to panelist. And uh, he, uh, no, my, my option says here, change role to attendee. So no, he's not, he's not, a, he's not a viewer. I'm just going <laughs> to. All right. I'm going to mute hey. the audio here. <laughs> just kick Scott out. <laughs> <laughs> I heard him laugh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Okay. Well, let's, let's just go ahead. If Scott gets that figured out, we can bring him in in five minutes or so if he gets all that figured out. But First Timothy chapter 3 may be a good place to that's start. A, that's a great place to start. So, First Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at this as we think about the idea of someone being a bishop uh, or an overseer. Your translation may say uh, bishop in the Old King James or overseer if you have a more modern translation. First Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, and that's your word, bishop as well, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. And it goes on through several other descriptions of the character that this man is supposed to have. Um, so we see here that a bishop, uh, which is another word for overseer, uh, what is one of the requirements to serve in that role, according to Scripture? Husband of one wife. He's got to be married. Mm -hmm. And so the Catholic Church has a teaching, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it would be the priests as well as the bishops who yeah. are prohibited from being married. Right, right. A bishop is going to be a priest, but they're priests who would not be bishops, but all the priests in the Roman Catholic Church in general, are forbidden to, from, from being married. Now, there are some parts of the world where there are some, um, I guess you could say, subsidiaries of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, some parts of the Roman Catholic Church where they permit priests to marry. But in general, throughout most of the world, they're not permit, permitted to marry, um, and that includes the bishops. And uh, yet here we're, we're looking at this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where we see bishops now, and, and they have to be married. Now, let's be, let's be clear here. When we read about bishops in the New Testament, and then we see bishops in the Roman Catholic Church, there are a lot of ways in which those two things don't match up. Very in different. In other words, 
they may call their clergy bishops in the Roman Catholic Church, but they don't meet a lot of the qualifications that we see in, in, in the New Testament, and they don't uh, really have the same function as what we see in the New Testament or the limitations on their authority that we see in the New Testament. But this is what the New Testament says about a bishop or an overseer. He's supposed to be the husband of one wife. Drew, you got something there? I didn't know if you were going to go to the next chapter, because in the very next chapter, Paul warns, he says in verse 4, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 1, he says, now the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. Now that's a strong accusation. Sure. Sure. For the insincerity of liars, liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage. Right. And require absence from foods that God created. He created both the institution of marriage and, of course, foods, the food we can eat, to receive these things in Thanksgiving. Uh, for everything God, I'm sorry, everything created by God is good, and that would include marriage. Yeah, I'm glad you, you went to that passage. Um, and the most immediate application of, of what we see Paul talking about in 1 Timothy chapter 4 is going to be to the Gnostic teachers, who uh, we see a lot about them in the second century, and in the New Testament, we see evidence of their influence in the first century even, and they had some ideas about, uh, about humanity and, and, and uh, about deity. They had a concept of an evil God to whom they attributed the physical creation, and, and so they regarded the physical creation, including the human body, as something really a negative, as something evil, and salvation was an intellectual thing, and uh, so it was not uncommon amongst some of those Gnostic teachers to teach their followers that, that their followers needed to bring the body into harsh submission and, and they forbade marriage. Interestingly, even though in the Catholic Church there was opposition to the Gnostic teaching, that Gnostic concept, that asceticism, we might say, ended up influencing Catholic doctrine. That's interesting. Uh, we had a comment come in from Holly that says, uh, I don't want to offend anybody, but this is why God intends for us to have this in marriage. He never said to be celibate. Paul did talk about staying single if it would give you a problem. Um, and I'm assuming what she's referring to is Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Let's look at that real quick here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And in the context here, Paul is responding to a letter that the Corinthians have written to him. And we know from the reports that Paul had gotten that there are people who were being very sexually promiscuous, even with the prostitutes. And so he addresses that at the end of chapter six. But apparently there are also people buying into some kind of idea where you shouldn't have natural relations with your mm -hmm. wife. And it is, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. And the idea is sexually. And so in chapter seven, verse one, he's going to address this. He says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of t the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And a little bit later, he will say uh, there are advantages to remaining single or, and being celibate. He says down in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 7, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn, and the idea of to burn with passion. I've got a question for you, uh, Stephen. Uh, my translation says the same thing. It, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations. But isn't that, if it was worded a little differently and it said, there's nothing wrong with a man not having sexual relation. In other words, he's not saying you can't have sexual relations. It's good that you don't do that. He's saying there's nothing wrong with not doing it. But well, and I, and I think what's happening there in verse one is he's quoting from their letter. Uh, this is one way that I appreciate the English standard version. It puts that phrase, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. It puts it in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's happening there. He says, now concerning the things about which you wrote, and then he quotes what they were saying, it's good for a man 
not to have sexual relations with a woman. And then he responds by saying, because of temptation to sexual morality, everyone should have their own spouse. Yeah, there's several places throughout the letter where he, he seems to quote their motto or their idea, and, and not all of them may have had the same idea, uh, but we see it back in chapter 6 and verse 13 when we see the expression meats for the belly and belly for meats. Um, that seems to have been a motto among some of the Corinthians trying to justify fornication, which is kind of the opposite view. There were some who were saying that's what the body's made for. So he quotes their motto, meats for the belly and belly for meats, meaning the body is created for sexual relations. And so they're going to have them regardless of whether they're married or not. And he quotes that and then refutes it. And, and perhaps again here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it does seem likely that that's what he's doing when he says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. That's something some of them were saying. And so I'd, I'd be wrong that, would I be wrong then in saying, well, here's a good, uh, here's a reason why we need to be celibate. I think, I think so. I think so. Now, Paul does later on in, the, in chapter 7 talk about the fact that there's a, a distress, some kind of thing he calls a present distress among the saints at Corinth at this time, which is going to make marriage difficult. You're going to have to be concerned not only for your safety or well-being or whatever, you're going to be burdened with having to be concerned about another's well-being and safety. And so he talks about some difficulties associated with marriage. And he does in chapter seven say, you know, if everybody had the same constitution that I do, uh, it, every, you could just be unmarried. But let's back up to the very beginning. Is marriage something that's intrinsically good or not? And some people, and I think some people get this idea from the Catholic Church, they get the idea that marriage and sexual relations is a concession to man, but it's not really the ultimate state of holiness. But when you look at Genesis chapter 1, before the first sin, God has created uh, man, he's created in male and female, and Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28 says, And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I'm not sure how you do that without sexual relations. <laughs> he's, he's teaching man uh, that this is, the, this is the idea. And we come to chapter 2, and when we have the details of the creation of the woman given now, uh, it says in verse 23, when the man wakes up, he becomes aware that God has created a woman. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then there's this statement, which is not Adam's statement, but God's statement. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And this is all set up with the statement back in chapter 2, in verse 18, when, it, when God said, it is not good for the man to be alone, I will make him a helper suitable for him. And then he creates the woman. So marriage was something that God had in mind for man as something that is good. It's not an inferior state of holiness. Well, and it says here at the very last verse, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There, there's nothing shameful or inferior or not good about this situation that they were in. God created it. I also think about Hebrews 13 and verse 4 in the New Testament where this is explicitly said. Um, let me turn to there and get it right. Hebrews 13 and verse 4 where the Hebrew writer says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Mm -hmm. There are ways to pervert sexuality, but the marriage bed is to be held in honor and to be undefiled. And, and you know, it's, it's also interesting to remember that when Paul wants to describe the relationship between Jesus the Christ and his church, it is spoken of in terms of the relationship between a husband and his wife. And that's really something we see in the Old Testament, the relationship between God and and his covenant people is described as a marriage. Uh, and when they are unfaithful to him, when they go and worship other gods, it's a violation of that marriage covenant. And um, you even see the language of divorce used in this. And so what I'm saying is marriage is used throughout the Bible to represent the holy communion between God and his people. And so, again, it's not something that's held up as an inferior state of holiness. Might mention one more passage, 1 Thessalonians 4.3. This is the will of God, 
even your sanctification, your holiness, that you abstain from fornication, immoral sexual relations, sexual relations outside of marriage, that each one of you know how to possess himself of his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the passion of lust, even as the Gentiles who know not God. And it goes on and makes it clear marriage and sexual relations within marriage, that's holiness, that's sanctification, or part of your sanctification. So I guess the point you're bringing out is that the Catholic Church has no biblical authority to prevent uh, anyone from being married, including their priests and bishops. That's right. And I, I was trying to find the quote, but it's interesting how it came about that the Catholic Church taught the idea of celibacy. And, and it does seem there was some influence of the Gnostic ascetic ideas. By asceticism, we mean severely disciplining oneself, with, withholding from oneself various pleasures. You see allusions to that in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 23, uh, handle not nor taste nor touch, those kinds of rules men would make up that are not from God. But there's another influence that, that comes along later on. I, I was trying to find the quote, but there's a series of books here uh, by Philip Schaff, History of the Christian Church. I believe it, it's in there, and it would be in other sources as well, where it talks about back in the, in the Middle Ages, there was, a, there was a power struggle. There was a concern that um, you could have bishops um, develop such a, a center of power in their geographical region that the Pope would have trouble keeping them in line. And one way that could develop is if bishops were getting married and having children that would follow in their steps, you could have dynasties established. You could have this dynasty, this ruling family of bishops in this geographical region, you know, father, son, grandson, cousin, and so on. And the bishop, uh, office of the bishop could be passed down through that family, and it would no longer be under the pope's control who was bishop over there. And so one of the motivations uh, for saying that bishops had to be celibate, couldn't marry, was to prevent those kinds of dynasties from developing. That's, make, that's about power struggle. That's wow. not about the spiritual kingdom of God and what we read in the New Testament. So then you end up with a situation where you've got this, this idea perpetuated in the Catholic Church that somehow sexual union is not the ultimate holy state and that bishops shouldn't be married. And then what happens? You start attracting people to those offices who don't have the, the, the view of marriage and sexuality that is taught in the Word of God. And so who is to be surprised when the view they do have is contrary to the Word of God, and they, they pursue unnatural and immoral relationships? I mentioned about uh, how there's no biblical authority for the Catholic Church to do such things, uh, and, and Karen had mentioned, she brought up, consider how, many, how few Catholics have a Bible, let alone read it. And I was raised Catholic, and we did have a Bible somewhere in our house, but I was never encouraged to read it by the nuns or the... I went to Catholic school all my life, and no one ever encouraged us to read the Bible. So, yeah, I didn't know those things were in there. When you were growing up in the Catholic Church, Drew, did you imagine, Did you? was it in your thoughts that, you know, if I just picked up the Bible, I could see what God's will was? Or was it in your thoughts that you, there's really no point in it because the priest needed to tell you what it meant anyway? Oh, yeah. I was told that the priest and the hierarchy will tell me what is right and wrong, and I had the catechism. That was where our minds were just mm -hmm. bent and studying, answering the questions, and, and knowing the religion through their doctrine. So then in the Catholic Church, for generations, you've had people who had this idea they were dependent upon the priests for understanding the Word of God, and yet what we're seeing is these very priests upon whom you're dependent for understanding the Word of God don't understand the Word of God. When I started reading the Bible, I was in my 20s, mid-20s, and I, uh, someone asked me to read something in, in, in the Bible. You know, In fact, it was in First Timothy, the one you started with. And it, he says, Drew, what does that say there? Do you want to read that? And I read that where it said the bishop had to be married. At 22, 23 years old, I was in shock that I read this in the Scripture. So I went back to the priest that, that week 
And he didn't have an answer. And he said, well, basically what your problem is, is that your order of, uh, of authority is not correct. And I said, well, what's that? He says, the Pope is at the top of the, of the food chain. He didn't use that term, but I'm using that. Mm -hmm. Authority starts with the Pope. Second is church tradition. And then lastly is the Bible. So in some of the, and I've got several books here, Catholic catechisms. Here's a couple. Um, these, are, these are books put out by, the, by uh, representatives of the Catholic Church in which they, uh, I got turned that way, in which they go through and they set forth Catholic doctrine. This one's kind of, this one's kind of fun because it's question and answer format. You go through and it asks a question and it, and it gives you the answer. And, um, and with respect to their source of authority, uh, there's a section in here that talks about that. And let's see if I can flip to it real quickly. While you're flipping through, I just want to add that I just bought that not too long ago on Kindle. So you can get it for a few bucks on your iPad or Kindle. Did you really? Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> All right. Let me, let me see. I thought I could just flip right to it, but I'm going to have to look at the table of contents here. And... It, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to take me a minute. So if somebody else has got something, I'll come back to this in a second. Yeah, I was shocked, though, when the priest came back to me. Uh, uh, I was looking for sincere answers to, to the question, why does the Catholic Church teach celibacy when it says right there in the New Testament, not just one place, that a bishop must be married and have believing children? So here it is. Uh, this is the section on sacred tradition in this little Catholic catechism. Why is sacred tradition of equal authority with the Bible? Wait a minute. Right there, the, the assumption is sacred tradition is equal in authority to the Bible. And then they, they say, well, why? And the answer is the Bible and sacred tradition are of equal authority because they're equally the Word of God, both derived from the inspired vision of the ancient prophets, etc., who is authorized to interpret scripture and tradition? And the answer is given, the church's hierarchy, that is, the bishops under the Pope, or the Pope alone, is divinely authorized to decisively interpret scripture and tradition. And so their doctrine is that their tradition is just as authoritative as the Bible itself, and in either case, it's the officials, the, the hierarchy, and maybe the Pope himself, who have to tell everybody what either tradition or the Word of God means. So it's very, it's very different than taking the, the Scriptures and saying, you know, here's how God speaks to me, and, uh, and that is going to be my authority. Okay, Jeff, so we got through to this section of the discussion, but we started with the, the issues and the headlines that are happening. Right. So where's your connection there? So the connection is when we leave the Word of God, the Scriptures, behind, and we start looking to men, and men who have different motives, they're trying to protect their power, and they come up with doctrines that per perpetuate an unnatural and unscriptural concept of sexuality, and they make a rule, men made the rule, God didn't, that says priests cannot marry, uh, then they're going to attract men to their priesthood who have an unnatural, immoral, ungodly, unscriptural perception of sexuality. And then why should we be surprised when there's all kinds of sexual immorality going on amongst that priesthood? All right. Um, well, th any comments that our viewers want to add uh, about this and what's been in the news lately and, and about the need to simply go back to the Bible. You, you know, one more thing that we might talk just briefly about, Stephen, you started with first Timothy chapter three and verses one and two, and where it says a bishop must be the husband of one wife, right? Mm -hmm. We might take just a moment to talk about what a bishop is in the new Testament and what a bishop is in the Catholic church and how they're different. So you mentioned that the word bishop is, can also, and in some translations, is translated overseer, right? Yes, that's right. And so uh, I believe that it comes from a Greek word that breaks down to overseeing is the idea. Sure, sure. Episcopus, the epi part means over, and the scopus part would be sight, like in a scope, a microscope, a telescope, so scopus, episcop, episcopus. 
And so he's an overseer. But when you look at the New Testament, what you see is not bishops who oversee huge geographic regions or dioceses. Is that, is that the plural of diocese? I don't know. <laughs> Diocese. <laughs> Diocese. Uh, but you, you, let's look at, for example, in First Peter chapter 5, um, where Peter refers to himself as an elder, an older man who is uh, in a position of leadership in the church, writing to fellow elders and he says to them, let's start in chapter 5, verse 1, The elders therefore among you I exhort whom a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, whom also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Tend the flock of God which is among you, exercising the oversight. And there's the reference to the work of an overseer or of an episcopus, or some translations say bishop. Right. Um, and so they're to tend the flock of God, which is among them. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, we see these elders who are episcopoi or bishops. Uh, they're appointed in every church. Um, in Acts chapter 20, where Paul is talking with the elders of the church at Ephesus, we see that back in verse 17. He says to them in verse 28, Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops or overseers. These were the church, the elders, overseers of the church at Ephesus. That would have been the flock of God that was among them. We don't see a concept of bishops um, ruling over vast swaths of Christendom. Yep. We only see that starting to happen historically in the third century, I believe. Uh, oh, okay. where, where, where a, a, a bishop or an elder is, I think the title was a presiding bishop. Yeah. I think he was a, a appointed over the others. And then eventually the presiding bishops went and joined together amongst themselves and they had a council of bishops. And then you saw that the local bishops were starting to dis disseminate and you didn't really have any bishops in the local group anymore, but more or less a bishop over more than one. Yeah, especially in the third century. I'm, I guess uh, uh, maybe late third century. Um, well, hang on here. Uh, third century is the 200s. Yeah, it would be um, the fourth century. So in, especially in the fourth century, maybe late third century also. Yeah, Stephen? Oh, we just had a question come in from Holly uh, asking, and this may be something we uh, take uh, at another time, but she asked, uh, when I talk to people of the Catholic faith, they get very defensive and offended because they consider their traditions so important. How can I talk to them without offending them? You know, I think there's an interesting parallel, just trying to help people see, because one of the things, you know, tradition is important in all human relations. Um, we have traditions of holidays, we have family traditions, we have national traditions, and, and we really cling to these in so many ways. And um, somehow people get the idea that religious traditions give them some kind of anchor to the past. Um, but it's interesting when we look at the New Testament, in the first century, Jesus came into a religious world in which there was a written word of God, the Old Testament scriptures, and there was a body of oral tradition that had grown up around those scriptures. And so Jews in the first century would have been very similar to Catholics today who say, well, the, our traditions and the written word of God are of equal authority. The Jews of the first century were very much focused on the traditions, the oral traditions that had grown up around their written word. And yet, what do we see Jesus doing? Rebuking the Jews who equated their traditions with the written scriptures. And one example is in Mark, the seventh chapter. It's in a context where Jesus' disciples are eating with unwashed hands. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't belittle the idea of washing your hands before eating. We taught our children to wash their hands before eating. But this is not a, a hygiene thing. This is a religious ritual that the tradition of the Jews advocated, demanded. And Jesus' disciples didn't seem to be following that. And when they were criticized, Jesus said this. What chapter and verse are you in again? Mark chapter 7, verse 6. 
Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, talking to the critics of his disciples, the people who were insisting on holding up the tradition. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrines the precepts of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold fast the tradition of men. He said to them, full well, do you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition? And then he gives an example of something that was the word of God from their written scriptures, one of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother. And he showed how that by following their traditions, they were not obeying the written word of God. Clearly what Jesus is saying is, when you put so much emphasis on your traditions and making them equal to the word of God, or even setting aside the word of God to keep your traditions, you're leaving God behind. So how do we then help um, Holly and others that you want to try to get into a conversation and they get offended? I, I used to get offended when I was a Catholic and people would try to come talk to me about things like that. Um, Karen has a comment. She says in response to that, first teach God and his personality. And her perception is Catholics do not know the true God. So start from the Old Testament. You know, that's not a bad idea. Go to scripture, teach who God is from the Old Testament. Teach the God who is, who is a holy God and who cannot condone sin and his attitude towards sin. And then teach God's solution to that problem. There's the key. Go to the scripture. Because mm -hmm. when, any, when anyone was talking to me about God in my early 20s, it was their word against my word. But when one fella, just one guy came up to me, he didn't say a word about any religion. He opened up the Bible and he said, just read that. And when I read that, I didn't get offended at anything he said because he wasn't saying anything. But I was totally blown away by what I was reading. So I think then on our conversations with people, let's not have them if we can't open up a Bible. You know, it's not a bad idea when you're talking with somebody, you're trying to reach them with the gospel, and maybe it's somebody who's grown up Catholic, maybe even somebody who holds dear a lot of their traditions, to just, instead of say, saying to yourself, let me show this person what's wrong with Catholicism, to say, hey, how about let's sit down and read the Bible together? And you, the, the person will be amazed at the number of times they'll see something in the Bible that's different than what they were taught. I, I remember sitting around a kitchen table with a, a, a number of people who had been raised in the Catholic Church. And, and as we would read the Bible together, time and again, they would say, that's not what I was taught. That's not what the church teaches exactly. it is in the Bible, which they've been told is the Word of God. Yeah, yeah. See, I was always told it was the Word of God, but they'll explain it to me, so I don't need to read it. But when I started reading it, I came to that same conclusion that you're that you're just talking about. I don't remember knowing about that. Stephen, you look like you've got a question from a viewer or something that we need to be giving attention to. Oh no, I was reading um, something uh, w that we'll discuss in a little bit. But okay. uh, yep, carry on. Okay. Well, um, we've got about six minutes. Uh, of, of uh, program left here. Do we want to move on to our second topic for the day or, or try to get that in at all or save that for next week? I suspect that uh, that will take more than six minutes. Okay, we'll save that for next week then. We'll come back to the idea of, of music and worship next uh, week. We do, we do have uh, a comment that's come in here in response to Holly's question about uh, responding to her Catholic friend. Danielle comments, Holly, I think one thing we need to keep in mind is meeting people where they are. Try not to go into a conversation with the Catholic telling them what they believe. Ask them what they believe and why. Discuss what they bring up. Not every member of a denomination believes everything their church teaches. But if you can show them what scripture says about the things they believe, then you can get to steady ground of God's word. That's, that's good advice. Then. That's good. Yeah, because that's what we're all really doing. We're all trying to come to God's word together. And there may be any number of things that any of us are wrong on. But if we can come to God's word agreeing and saying, yes, this is the sole authority, not human tradition, but God's tradition as written in scripture. Mm -hmm. This is uh, our sole authority. Then we can work things out uh, because we have a basis on which to agree or disagree looking at the written word and not trying to add to that or take away from that based on what men have said through the centuries. And just to reiterate something, you know, we may have viewers watching this who are Catholic, and, and any time 
you are a part of some kind of group and you hear criticism of your group, it's easy to become defensive and say, wait a minute, you're, you're attacking our people. Other people are guilty of the same thing. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's very many who are going to try to, def- well, there would be some who would try to define the pedophilia, but I think most Catholics would say, well, this is horrible, uh, but other people are guilty too. And, and that's true. Um, you know, sexual sin is just something that is uh, characteristic of our, our society, all corners of our society. And uh, no, no denomination, and denominations aren't from God, but no denomination can be said to be immune from having sexual sin uh, among its members. But the point here is that it's, it's when we see an official doctrine that says our religious leaders cannot be married and should not have, um, well, should not have sexual relations within marriage, it's, it's not unlikely that they're going to attract people who are not interested in getting married to a woman, and then you're going to have these kind of problems. And, I don't, right. and again, it's not the issue we're not attacking. In fact, the headlines are coming in from among uh, other leaders and the, uh, um, officials within the Catholic Church making complaints that the higher-ups were hiding it and trying to play it down and not uh, not address the problem straight on. And that's, that's let, me just, let me just put it this way. To our viewers, those of you who are, are men uh, amongst our viewership here, If you were told that there's a career that you could choose, uh, but you could never uh, marry, and let's suppose that you are somebody who um, you would like to get, you would like to have sexual relations with an intimate spouse or somebody that you love and share your life with, uh, that's important to you, and you believe that can only be in marriage. And now you've got this career opportunity, but it says you can never marry. Are you likely to pursue that career? I think most of us would say, well, no, I'm going to scratch that, that one off the list uh, because I believe that sexual relations belong in marriage and, and I would like to have a partner through who, with whom I can share my life and an intimate partner and somebody uh, that I can share this relationship with. And so I'm not interested in that career. So then who is it that is going to be interested in that career? People who are interested in other things than what God directs us to do. And, you know, as we think about this whole idea of just approaching other people about their beliefs, uh, because, again, corruption within a system does not inherently make what that system teaches wrong. There's going to be sin in any number of people who hold any number of beliefs. But what we want to continue coming back to is what does the word of God say? Mm -hmm. And looking at ourselves as well. Jesus teaches us not to judge with hypocritical judgment. Um, and you know, not to, you know, be looking at the beam, uh, or the, what we would say is the beam in our brother's eye when we have a beam actually in our own Jesus, eye. Don't, don't look at the moat in your brother's eye while you've got a beam in your own eye. Yeah. That's right. And it's easy to see sin when it's out there. And the first thing you have to do is look at sin when it's in here. Mm-hmm. But he says, get the beam out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to get the speck out of your brother's eye. And so uh, there are times where we have to, to call things out as we see them and we have to keep coming back to God's word. And again, what we have here is a prohibition against what God created to be good within marriage and the fallout from that. Well, let's, let's use the last few seconds of the webcast today, if we can, just to preview what we'll likely be talking about next week. We were intended to get to it today and didn't get to it. But that is music and worship. And, and one of the things that we're going to say is that, that when people say music, oftentimes they're thinking only instrumental music. God wants there to be music and worship. Um, but we're going to be talking about the question of does he want there to be instrumental music in worship today? And, and one of the things that we're going to, to discuss is the fact that uh, if you go back just a couple hundred years, 300 years ago, it would have been unusual to have instrumental music in worship. Today, when people think that it's just, of course you should have instruments in worship. That's actually a fairly recent innovation um, and it's clearly recent attitude, but we'll talk about that next week, I think. And, I, and the key word there is innovation. Man wants to always innovate his religion and his worship. 
Yeah. Well, we do want to invite more questions, and we ask people to go to BibleQuest.tv. Uh, if you're on the podcast, obviously you're listening to this recording, but we invite you to go to BibleQuest.tv, fill out the form, and send in your questions or comments, make comments, and uh, so we can address them and share them on the air at the next program. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining in today and the comments that, that came in and the questions. And guys, you did a great job. I really appreciate everything. And I'm sorry we lost Scott. Uh, whatever happened to Scott, but he, I have to give him credit for trying to come in, though, on his trip. He did send a message apologizing for his technical difficulties. Uh, they had some technology failure on his end, and so uh, hopefully he'll be able to join us next week. And we miss Scott when he's not here. That's right, right. And, and uh, uh, Stephen, you do have the button today. So uh, good to see everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. See you next week. Bye-bye.